Nostalgia is truly a dangerous weapon. No matter if it's a film, a TV series, a video game, if we enjoyed them as kids, we probably still hold them in high regard. For the most part, these titles still hold up perfectly for us when we experience them again as adults, either because they are legitimately good or simply out of nostalgia blinding us from seeing the flaws on it. But once in a blue moon, we play these games again and something is not right. We start noticing the flaws, the lack of polish, the cheesiness that we originally found to be so cool. Was this game always this bad? We ask ourselves. And while I have experienced that before, today I'm going to talk about a time where this question was asked and my reply was, no, this game wasn't always this bad. This is just a bad port. In today's video, I will talk about Rayman Revolution and how it fails to be a proper remake or port of Rayman 2. Rayman 2 The Great Escape is a platformer adventure game created by Ubisoft and directed by Michel Ancel, released to the public in the year 1999. Saying this was an ambitious project for the time would be an understatement. It was a sequel to the hit success that was Rayman, one of the last 2D platformers released before the jump to 3D. While they were planning to make the game a 2D platformer again, this idea was scrapped and the game was developed from scratch. The creator had to convince the team not to give the game tank controls, an entirely separate game had to be developed to see what worked and what didn't in the engine. The development of the game was not easy, but once it was finally released, the game was a massive success, and rightfully so. The game had great graphics for the time, coupled with an amazing atmosphere, and the levels were well designed and not as hard as the ones in Rayman 1. The characters and story were memorable, the collectathon elements were well implemented, and who can forget that amazingly cinematic soundtrack? The game was a bit lacking in terms of combat, both with regular enemies and boss battles, but it is a mere nitpick in the grand scheme of things. Ubisoft knew how well received this game became, porting it to every console, and I mean every console, Nintendo 64, PC, Dreamcast, Playstation, Nintendo DS, Nintendo 3DS, iOS, and even an entirely different game with the same name on the Game Boy Color. Besides that last one though, all the ports of Rayman 2 remained relatively consistent, from 1999 to 2011 with the larger differences being mainly due to hardware limitations rather than creative choices. This, however, had an exception, Rayman Revolution. Released in the year 2000 for the PlayStation 2, this was not your ordinary port of the game, but rather a remake of it, keeping the extractor and the levels relatively the same, but adding extra features. Sounds like a great deal, right? That is, if it wasn't for the fact that this game's new features end up hurting the package as a whole, changes that seem minor at first, but accumulate in such a way that it ends up ruining the experience. Let's start with this game's biggest change. The most notable change in this game is none other than the way that you select levels this time around. In the original version, you had a simple level select screen known as the Hall of Doors, which allowed you to jump from level to level. It had a great atmosphere, played one of the best themes in the game, and even had a small nods to what the level was all about. The Dreamcast and 3DS versions, which I cannot properly judge as I haven't played them, replaced it with the Island of Doors. It has the same function, except it was represented via a 3D rendered map screen heavily inspired by Donkey Kong Country and Crash Bandicoot. 
I prefer the visuals of the Hall of Doors, but it has the same linear structure, so I am not complaining. Rayman Revolution, however, throws this out of the window to introduce an open world to explore and where you find the level zone. You can clearly tell they were going with a Mario 64, Spyro the Dragon style in this game's half world, making you go to different places in this world to reach each one of the levels. But there are a few issues with this half world that makes it just nothing more than a chore and makes me miss the old level select screen so much. The thing with half worlds is that they exist for a reason. Besides Mario and Spyro, think of other games with half worlds like Banjo Kazooie, or Jack and Daxter, or the first Sly Cooper, Crash Bandicoot 2 and 3. They all have something in common and that is non-linearity. The reason these games have half worlds is because in each one the player has the choice when it comes to choosing levels. Sure, you cannot choose any level you want, as they are often hidden behind a certain number of collectibles or you have to be in a certain world to play those, but you always have several options to choose almost at any point of the game. Doesn't matter if the levels themselves are linear, if you are able to go to the hub world and choose any level you want out of a selective number, then it serves its purpose. There is a reason you have to walk back and forth. Rayman 2 has a linear progression. You have to go from one level to the next with no real option to go on different routes or play the levels out of order, with the exception of least levels, which are not even present in Revolution the same way. We'll go back to that in a second. What matters is that there is no real point in this hub world to exist in any way from a gameplay point of view. Exploring this place to get to the next level is nothing more than a longer version of this. And if moving around was fun, then I wouldn't mind it, but believe me when I tell you that Rayman was not prepared for worlds like this. He moves too slowly and does not have any ways of moving faster. In fact, the only movement option that he has is to move more slowly. One could say that the game becomes non-linear once you beat more levels as you have to go back to previous levels to collect the lumps and break the cages you didn't open, but here is why that is not an excuse. That's right, once you beat a level, a portal to it appears in this circle of stones. There is no point in exploring the hub world after you've gotten a level. They are so boring too, not in terms of design, they look pretty in this style of the game, even though there are some minor glitches. What happens is that, besides collecting a few lumps and solving a few puzzles to open levels, there's almost nothing you can do here. In the first hub world, because yes, there are multiple of them. There is a baby Globox telling you that he had a farm with Minosaurus before they became aggressive. You would think these guys would turn good if you complete some sort of mission, but nope, they are nothing but invincible enemies. The same goes for the baby Globoxes playing football in the second hub world, Globox's house. But going back to the first hub, there is a base with infinitely respawning robo-pirates. No matter how much you destroy them, they will stay there. And after destroying enough of them, you are able to go through a door and get one or two lumps. But without a doubt, the worst part of this hub wars is this section in between the second and third hubs. You have to fight a huge army of robo-pirates from a bird view perspective. And I'm sorry, but this fight drags on and on and on for way too long. You have to defeat so many pirates and there is no indicator of when they are going to stop. I understand they tried to go with a top-down shooter homage, but it makes for such a repetitive section. That's what the hub world feels like. Nothing more than a distraction preventing you from playing the actual game. 
at the very least it can be used to visit the brand new shop to buy brand new upgrades and the brand new lease house to play mini games, right? Imagine Nintendo decides to release a remake of Super Mario 64. Imagine Nintendo decides to release another remake of Super Mario 64, one that is advertised with a new feature, being that Mario can now use the coins he collects to buy new upgrades for his moveset in a shop. You get the game, you start playing, and for some reason Mario cannot use his triple jump when we jump in three times in a row. You can crouch and press the jump button, but you cannot use the backflip. You run and press the attack button, but you cannot use the dive. A Mario's main attack, the three punch combo, has been nerfed into a single punch. But after collecting the first star of Bob on Battlefield with his limited moveset, Toad opens a shop and this is what he sells. Sounds totally ridiculous, right? Well, say hello to Rayman Revolution, a game that does exactly that. The lungs you collect in the game can be used to supposedly buy upgrades for Rayman at a shop run by one of the teensies. The problem is, these upgrades were things that you could do in the original game from the very start. In the original, Rayman was able to shoot glowing balls out of his hand, which you could shoot as many times as you would want and would bounce on walls and other surfaces. Later on, Meeting Lee would give you the ability to use these projectiles to latch into purple lumps like a grappling hook. And Rescuing Globox gives you the ability to charge this attack for a more powerful projectile. In Rayman Revolution, you can shoot one ball. And that's it. But if you visit the shop, you can buy upgrades to shoot more, for it to bounce on walls, and to charge it up. Notice how none of these new upgrades are actually new, they simply took abilities that you got from the start of the game, or were unlocked naturally after reaching a level, and hid them behind a paywall. Luckily this was the PS2, can you imagine if these were locked behind an actual paywall? Most jarringly is the fact that rescuing Lee would still give you the ability to lodge into purple lumps, so this shop could have been avoided altogether. But speaking of limiting Rayman's abilities, let's go to the first scene of the game, where Rayman meets Globox and escapes the ship. In the original game, Globox gives Rayman the ability to shoot his fist, which I have already described. In the remake, he gives you the ability to punch. Not a wind-up punch, not those cool combos from Origins and Legends, just a punch. You're stuck with this puny punch for the entirety of the Woods of Light, a level with no enemies, mind you, to use it only to break a cage, free the Teensies and their king, and give you the ability to shoot, leaving this punch never to be used in this game ever again. Why would you give Rayman an ability that you would only use in one and a half level to completely take it away from him once it ends? That reminds me of a game that actually did this concept right, none other than Rayman 3. In that game, Rayman loses his hands at the start of the game, already giving this gameplay choice a more reasonable excuse. Because of his lack of hands, you cannot punch stuff so instead, your only attack is a kick. Except, when you get your hands back, you can still use this kick as a way to attack enemies that are close to you, it is not entirely removed from your moveset. That would have been a good way to implement Rayman's punch in here, maybe make it a viable ability, a move that's stronger than Rayman's projectiles, but requires you to get up close and personal. Maybe add buffs to your overall stats, such as jump, speed when running or flying, damage input. Maybe you could make the shop be used for cosmetic changes, like costumes, or make so Rayman's projectiles become his hands, like in Rayman 1. Add some sort of minigames to buy, and that's where Lee's house comes into place. 
in the original game, there was a mechanic in which every time you broke 10 cages found in the levels, Rayman would increase his maximum health. Simple, but a good way to reward those avid enough to actively search for them. Here, the cages contain the so-called familiars, which after freeing 10, will unlock a minigame that you can play by visiting Lee in the hub world. And once you have completed that minigame, then you get the health upgrade. What? Isn't finding the cages enough of an achievement that needs a reward? I also have to play some dumb minigame before I can get the reward? Oh, and it only counts familiars and not cages, meaning that the cage with a teensy at the end of every level does not count. And if you're wondering if these minigames are at least new, no they aren't. For the most part, these minigames are actually ported over from the Dreamcast version of Rayman 2. There, some of them were unlocked by getting the Glob Crystals hidden in the levels. Once you got them, you could bring them to the Globox Village, a level exclusive to this version, and play them. Others were downloaded via the Dreamcast's download system. In that version, these minigames were just... minigames! They didn't hide anything that was originally just rewarded by actually playing the game. And speaking of actually playing the game, other challenges from Lee include the races that were optional in the original game and parts of levels that are now missing and have become challenges. Sam's water ski segment and the roller coaster chair segment are now gone and have become minigames. And if that wasn't enough, not even all of the Globox minigames are part of Lee's challenges. Some of them can be bought on the shop. Why didn't they do that for all of them? No clue. And you can tell they were added at the last minute by their names. BV Disc and BV Foot. Did anyone actually forget to actually name those files and left the placeholder names? It's very sad when the only actually new minigames are two suitors and Pong. But the pinnacle of new content, but not actually new content, is, without a doubt, the Rain Mask. Now in the original game, the story involves Rayman trying to get four magic masks to give them to the divine being Polocus, each mask being found on a sanctuary defended by a guardian boss, all except the fourth mask, which is simply given to you by a baby Globox during a cutscene. Here, the fourth mask has its own level and boss fight, which is really cool. They took something that was admittedly a bit of a cop-out in the original game and made it more unique. However, they kept the scene with the baby Globox, who now gives you the rain mask. This mask allows you to create rain to short circuit a door much like Globox does in his levels. And that's it. Or so I thought. It turns out that this mask allows you to backtrack to certain levels and use it to make plants grow and create platforms to reach new zones with hidden lumps. If the fact that you are forced to backtrack to get the 100% completion, meaning that you cannot get everything on a level in your first run, wasn't enough, these zones aren't even new zones. Instead, they are simply chunks of the original levels that are now inaccessible unless you backtrack and use the rain mask. I'm telling you, every new thing in this game is nothing but padding in order to make it feel longer than the original, by hiding abilities, upgrades and even chunks of levels behind a shop, a bunch of minigames and something they added not to have to rework a cutscene. No wonder why critics say the remake is harder. Of course it is going to be harder when you can't do things that you could do in the original game. This feels less like actual difficulty change and more like one of those self-imposed challenges that are so popular on YouTube nowadays. Speaking of reviews I did not agree with, I remember one review of Revolution that stated that it made you more immersed in the world of Rayman, and that the 11 Celeste screen in the original made you feel too much like if you were in a video game and not as immersed. My question is, have you actually played Rayman Revolution? Now, I am not going to seriously discuss the immersion of a game starring this thingamajig, but certain technical aspects of Rayman Revolution can be very annoying. In the original game, 
you could only save your game after or before entering a level, while in Rayman Revolution you are able to do that in the middle of a level, which is a good option. Some levels are rather long, so it is good to be able to turn off your console and resume your game in the exact same phase of the level you were originally in. The problem? There is no autosave, which means that every time you enter a new zone, besides the usual loading screen, you are asked if you want to save every single time. This gets insanely annoying. It is true that the original game also asked you if you wanted to save after finishing every level, but this one does it every time you enter a new zone. Simply adding an autosave option would have worked wonders. This is a PlayStation 2 game, so at the time this was already the norm. At the very least, ask the player if they want to save only if they quit or after the end of a level, not this. Doesn't help that the save screen and loading screen are so dull. The save screen had a cool background in the PC version, and it's black in the PS2 version. The loading screen has screenshots of the zone you were about to enter in the PC version, with the exception of the one when going back to the Hall of Doors, which is just some generic artwork of the game. The PS2 version, it has like a 5 animated GIFs of Rayman doing things and these are longer. They can really take you out of the experience much more than a simple level select screen, if you ask me. The game also lacks polish in a few aspects. The game runs well for the most part, but the hop worlds will sometimes have such massive drops of frame rate it is not even funny. There are a few audio glitches too, like the music suddenly stopping if you die at a certain scripted moment. I found it really underwhelming when I was fighting one of the bosses, died, and now had to do the entire fight without music. And with this game's amazing soundtrack, this glitch is a sin. Also, I don't know why or how, but this game actually froze me once, while fighting one of the new bosses nonetheless. One could argue about the new graphics, but they don't look that much different from the Dreamcast version. Plus, they have this thing in which certain characters like Rayman got great model overhauls, yet others remain relatively the same, 2D textures meant to be 3D objects included. It's especially noticeable with these scenes with the teensies, those models should not be as close to the camera as they are. Overall, this game looks very taped together and it feels it cannot be handled by a PS2, which is very pathetic given how even the DS version runs better. You know what? For all the bad things this remake did wrong, there are a few ones that I particularly enjoy, and made me wish for the game to have had more additions like this. First of all, the game really improved on one of the weaker aspects of the original, combat. I feel as if the pirate robots have been nerfed in order for them to be taken out more easily, no more shooting forever until they die. The same goes for the bosses. In Rayman 2 there weren't particularly special and they remain the same over here, but the new ones are not too bad. The new Guardian, Growland 13, is fought on an air section and he has a bit of a strategy behind it by hitting clouds to form over his head and shock him with lightning. BD Tank also has some strategy, making you hit switches to electrocute it and then shoot it with a cannon. And finally, Chenille, your basic divide the boss into pieces, too long for my taste to be honest, but at least it's not the shooting all the pirate segment. The hub world was praised for giving more time to the characters in the game, and I agree with it. We get to see certain characters more often thanks to it, like Globox and his family, who are hanging around once you rescue them, Lee in her house, and most importantly, Clark. This character, exclusive to Rayman 2, was originally found ill in one of the levels, making you go to the Cape of Bad Dreams to get the antidote. Beforehand, we had never seen him before, so he did not really leave much of an impact. In this upward, we get to see a bit of Clark action before he gets sick much later. 
we still have to assume Rayman and him are friends from before the game starts, but it's closer to how you meet characters like Globox or Lee in the original game. And speaking of characters, I was surprised to see Beat Sid back. He was a boss who became your friend in Rayman 1, and one of the many mosquitoes found in the series. He's back! He doesn't have much of a role besides taking you to the first sanctuary on a boat, but it is nice to have some connections to the first game, which was heavily ignored in 2. Another element I loved was the new Lums Radar, a magnet you unlock late in the game that shows where the Lums are. Unlike the Rain Mask, this new ability is actually very useful to get the 100%, so it is heavily appreciated. And I cannot talk about how good Rayman 2 is without talking about the music. All the music of the original game is back, plus some new ones. They all have a new leitmotif, making them a bit too different from the original game's soundtrack, but I love them just as much. From the Minisaurus playing... To Grolem 13's boss fight... To my favorite, Patrolling Pirates. All the new songs in this game are very good, except for one, but I will get to that. But the best part of this game is that, well, it's still Rayman 2. Despite the boring folk world and useless new additions and hiding the original content behind new chores and a few technical issues, this is still the amazing game that it was in other platforms. It is still full of great levels, lovable characters, an amazing atmosphere, a cinematic soundtrack and much more. If someone told me that they played Revolution and they thought it was a great game, I would believe them. It is not the best way to play Rayman 2 in my opinion, but it is a way to play Rayman 2, one of my favorite video games of all time. After all, the PlayStation 1 version is the one I grew up with, and that one removed plenty of content to add voice acting. Yet, being the only version I played, I didn't mind. Some would say that PlayStation 1 is the worst version. I feel Revolution is the worst version. And I have heard plenty of bad stuff about Rayman 3D. But I feel like the only way to make Rayman 2 into an actual bad game would be to make it into a completely different game. Because while I still consider Rayman Revolution to be a bad port of remake or whatever, it is still an enjoyable game from start to finish. Well, not exactly to finish. The original game's ending is as memorable as the rest of the game. Rayman gets the four masks and gives them to Polocus, who manages to destroy all of the pirates except for Admiral Razorbeard, the big bad of the game, who now has a giant robot that he ordered from... the villain of the 2D version of Rayman 2? Who became a character in Tonic Trouble? Sure, why not? You reach through his base, fight him on a two-phase battle that's somewhat different on the PlayStation 1 version. He blows up his base as he escapes, Rayman's friends think he died, but he is alive. Credits roll as Razorbeard escapes on his ship, and a medley of several songs in the game play. A very satisfying conclusion. Now, on to Revolution. The ending plays more or less exactly the same. You beat Razorbeard, the base goes boom, Rayman is dead, oh wait, Rayman is not dead, hooray, roll credits. And that's where the absolute pain comes by. That, my friends, is the credits sequence. The main characters of the game playing some music on a campfire. It is nice that we see that they are doing well after all they went through, but this music... It is such an embarrassing piece consisting of nothing but samples played on a seemingly random order with no melody to speak of. It is incredibly absurd and fits nothing with the atmosphere of the game or the rest of the songs. Hell, 
This song? It is not even original. One of the Globox minigames uses this exact same track. It is not even a track exclusive to the credits like in the original. This ending with the characters doing some sort of musical number would have fit in literally any other Rayman game but Rayman 2. And that's the worst part. Ever since this remake, we have never had a single Rayman game that follows the same aesthetic and tone as this one, as they all had to be comedic in one way or another. Rayman 3 had similar aesthetic, but the tone was way too comedic, and the story was very lazily put together and not taken seriously. And as much praise as the UbiArt games get, they are easily the most cartoony and surreal out of the entire series, even more than Rayman 1. I love these games, don't get me wrong, but I really miss the more serious and dark style of Rayman 2, and it doesn't help that we almost had a game with a tone reminiscent of Rayman 2, with a formerly colorful world being invaded by evil creatures from another world, but it ended up becoming the Rabbids games, who added an extra level of stupidity and were luckily separated from the original Rayman series. I shouldn't be this mad at this ending as I am. Hell, it is not even an ending, it is the credits. But it was a wake up call. Rayman 2 will never be used as a startup point of any future Rayman games, unless it's a port of said game. And even then, bizarre elements like Revolution's credits will happen. I guess a floating limb guy like Rayman will never take itself seriously ever again after this title. Or would it?